and uh, return it over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Emily Grizel. I'm the manager of the Sherman Animal Care Complex. Today, we're just going to be talking about helping injured and orphaned Texas wildlife. Um, I know this group knows a ton about wildlife, and there's going to be a lot of information in this PowerPoint. I tried not to make it too wordy, but um, hopefully just for the people watching on YouTube later on, there'll be some good information for them as well. So um, yeah, so first of all, a little bit about wild or a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Houston. Um, in the, the Katy area, um, I got my bachelor's of science at Texas A&M um, in wildlife and fishery science and started working at uh, wild, uh, wildlife rescue and rehabilitation as an apprentice um, just a few years ago now. So um, I kind of worked my way up into a caretaker position and um, I was the training supervisor out in Candelia for a couple of years and now I'm here in San Antonio. Uh, managing our intake location slash orphanage. Um, we keep all of the the um, healthy orphans here and raise them up and, and release them from here um, all around San Antonio. So um, yeah, just always had a passion for the natural world. I've actually been trying to find time in my life to join Master Naturalists. I'm an avid user of iNaturalist and just love going out in nature, hiking, kayaking, camping, photography, all of that. So um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to y'all today. Um, so these are my favorite animals, the possums. These are some guys that we rehabbed this year, drinking their water. Um, and I just wanted to share that just because, you know, they're my favorite animals, like I said, and um, I just think that they're so special and they get a bad rap sometimes, but they're really good neighbors. I'm sure y'all know that and appreciate them in your gardens. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about WRR before we get into the meat of it. Um, our mission here is to rescue, rehabilitate and release native wildlife. We also provide sanctuary, individualized care and a voice for other animals in need. So. Um, we do have our 212 acre sanctuary up in Candelia, as, as well as a um, rehabilitation hospital with our, where our vet staff works um, and all of our different caretakers for the hospital and the sanctuary. Um, so we save any animal. We don't really care about species or, you know, their status um, or if they're native or non-native. We'll take anyone and everyone. We really just focus on the individual. Um, so that's what really drew me to WRR. Um, we really respect every life um, that comes in. We, we refer to animals as he, she, they, them, um, and never it or, you know, thing. We believe that animals are, are someone, not something. Um, so yeah, if y'all ever want to come out and visit us, that would be great. We're not open to the public, but um, you're all my friends now, so I can give you a tour of our facility. Um, and I would love to have some naturalists out here that appreciate our wildlife. Um, but yeah, we don't put animals on display. We don't have any like education animals. Um, we do a lot of education, but we don't display animals while doing that. Um, we just don't want um, members of the public to see that and think that wild animals can be tamed or kept as pets. Um, so it's just kind of the opposite of what, you know, we're trying to do there. So, um, yeah, so we were founded in 1977. This year is actually our 45th anniversary. So I think that's a huge accomplishment. Um, the organization was started by Lynn Cuny in her backyard, um, in San Antonio. And she had this vision of, um, you know, multiple locations, huge sanctuary, um, just serving all of Texas and and we really serve you know the whole country as well as worldwide um, we've taken animals into our sanctuary um, from labs and circuses and things all over the world so um, yeah she was just 20 years old when she started this organization um, which is just a huge accomplishment I'm in my mid-20s so I think that's a, that's you know just huge for someone to do and just to have it grow into this huge 
nonprofit organization um, who, you know, we save, um, last year we saved over 11,000 animals and took in about, uh, I think, 100,000 calls from, from members of the public um, that led to, um, you know, an animal being saved or not, just depending on the need. So um, yeah, so now we're gonna just talk about uh, what you should do when you come across injured wildlife or seemingly abandoned neonates. So generally we have a few rules here that we'll tell people right away when they call um, with questions about an animal. First of all, you don't need to feed them. Um, we have specialized formula and feeding techniques for every single species. Um, if they're dehydrated or emaciated um, or you know, just not a, a cat, cow, or goat, the, those types of milks can really hurt them. Um, just food in general can, can hurt them if they're injured as well. Um, so gently picking them up, putting a t-shirt over them or a towel, putting them in a box with air holes to transport to WRR. Um, animals will bite. Obviously, they, they want to survive as well. They're scared of us. We like them nice and feisty. That's you know what we what we want them to stay like. So just give us a call if there's any question. Um, we'd be happy to help. We have um, hotline specialists here around the clock, um, and we also have volunteers who are willing to go out and pick up the animal from you and and pick them up and and bring them to us. So um, overall, you know, Mother Nature is the absolute ruler over life and death. Um, there's a few situations that you can help. Mother Nature, though, and and the young animal that you're that you've come across. So we're going to talk about um, just animals by age and species. Now, um, I'm not going to go through all of this information because I know y'all know what a nestling bird looks like. Um, but like I said, this is mostly information for people who just watch this on YouTube who don't have a huge natural history background. Um, so yeah, we get a ton of ton of nestling birds around this time of year. Um, if you come across a bird who is a nestling and they've seemed to fallen out of fall out of their nest and they don't seem injured, um, we always recommend just putting them back up in their nest if you can. Um, we also tell people, you know, if you can't reach the nest, you can make a makeshift nest out of a shoebox or a Tupperware with holes in the bottom. Um, and you can put it up as high in the tree as you can. Mom will actually take over that nest um, and, and continue to feed her baby. Um, contrary to popular belief, touching the baby won't actually cause the parent to abandon them. Birds are super great parents. They will like fight off cats and humans to protect their babies. So there, if you find a baby on the ground, there's probably a mama bird up in the tree looking at him, waiting for someone to come by and just put him back up in the tree. Um, obviously they can't just like grab the babies and bring them back up like a squirrel might be able to. Um, but yeah, there is that, that one way to try and help reunite them. Um, we'll get a lot of calls uh, and people say that, you know, the nest is probably on the roof or, um, you know, up so high in the tree, but there is still, you know, a chance that the, the mom will come to that makeshift nest if we just put the nest very close to where you found the baby. Um, and that's kind of the general idea for the rest of the animals we're gonna talk about, always trying to reunite first. Obviously, if they're injured, you can always bring them into us um, or just give us a call. We can send someone out to you. Um, if they're obviously injured, then we definitely wanna bring them in. Um, first of all, mom might not care to keep taking care of them if they're injured, but also they just, they need more care um, from a vet, from, you know, medications, things like that, if, if they're injured. So, yeah. So fledglings, it's a little bit different than nestlings. These guys are fledging the nest. They're almost adults. Um, they are jumping out of the nest a little bit too soon sometimes. They do spend some time on the ground flapping their wings, trying to build up those muscles to fly away eventually. So we talk to people about that probably 20 times a day right now. Um, it's always a good day when somebody brings in an uninjured fledgling and they are willing to take them back to where they found them. Um, yeah, so 
Obviously, again, if they're injured, please bring them in. Um, if they're uninjured, you can just watch them from a distance. Um, mom and dad are still in the area protecting them, feeding them. Um, the babies know to hide at night. Um, and then it usually only takes maybe three to five days for them to actually be able to fly off on their own. Um, so if they are in danger, possibly of being killed by a cat or a dog, you can put them back up in the tree. They might just jump back right down. Um, but they also are, you know, safe in bushes. Um, and if you can just keep pets out of the area for a while, um, sometimes, you know, people will call and we just ask them to, you know, try and keep your dog on a leash in the front yard, maybe. Um, so there are ways to just try and leave the bird alone still. Um, we really don't like bringing in fledgling birds um, because like I said, yeah, we're just not mom and dad. We are not um, the natural habitat that they should be in. And it, uh, being in rehab is pretty um, stressful for, for animals in general. So um, whenever we can try and reunite them with mom and dad, that's, that's the best. So adult birds, typically it's pretty obvious if they're injured. Um, a lot of injuries we see are, you know, window strikes, caught by dog, caught by cat, um, clipped by a car, um, stuck to glue traps, things like that. Um, if, if there's any obvious injury like this wing droop in the picture, um, they can definitely be brought in. Um, if there's ever any question also, whether they're a fledgling or an adult or if they're injured or not, you can always bring them in, send us a video, send us a picture, give us a call. Um, we love to like talk through things and solve, solve problems like that. Um, and I, I love when people come in just to double check. Um, we'll take a look at them. We'll, you know, give them a little physical exam real quick. Um, but yeah, we, we see a lot of window strike victims. We actually um, are a drop-off point for birds uh, that passed away from window strikes. Um, and then um, Texas A&M will come and pick them all up at the end of the season for their research. So um, yeah, typically with window strikes, we tell people to leave them, you know, in a safe spot and see if they fly away after a few hours. If they don't, then we will definitely bring them in. Um, a lot of times it's uh, something that we can just give some medication and have them be seen by our vet staff, of course, but um, a lot of times we can, you know, help them get through that. Sometimes, you know, they do pass away from window strikes. Um, or you know, domestic animals. Being caught by a cat is probably the number one thing we we get birds in for. Um, and if there's ever you know any possibility that an animal was has a puncture wound from a cat, we definitely want to do at least a, a round of antibiotics um, for them. So. Yeah, we, we see a lot of uh, glue trap birds, especially wrens for some reason. Um, they just love to get in glue traps. And so we use mineral oil to get them off of the, the glue traps and um, we'll uh, send them up to Candelia to be seen by vet staff as well. So, um, yeah, Let's see, so ducklings. Um, yeah, always try and reunite with mom first and foremost. Um, again, anyone that's injured can definitely be brought in. Um, but yeah, this happens a lot. We, um, people will bring in ducklings, you know, mom wasn't inside. They're not near a, a pond or anything like that. Uh, mom is just walking and she's just doing her thing. She doesn't realize that babies can't follow her over the fence or through the fence or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, always trying to reunite at first. We do take in ducks, both domestic and wild though. So yeah, so I know I didn't touch on all of the birds, um, but we mostly get, you know, songbirds and doves. Um, a lot of the same information applies from the songbirds applies to doves as well. Um, just always trying to reunite, um, seeing their development. You can tell by their feathers, you know, if they're a nestling or a fledgling and, and how feathered they are. Um, usually the, the fluff under their wings is the last to go before they're an adult. Um, so if you, you know, check under their wings, they might be a fledgling if it's still a little fluffy down there. Um, so yeah, some birds um, nest on the ground. So if you find a bird on the ground, it may just be that they're near their nest. Um, being, you know, 
familiar with those species is is a good idea. I've never come across a night jar or a night hawk in in the wild, but um, it's good to know. A lot of people will bring them in. They're like, oh, they were just sitting on a fence post. Well, yeah, that's what they do. So you can take them back. But um, yeah, so even if you find, you know, a, a dead mother or a dead father, usually there's another parent figure in, in the baby's life. So doesn't mean they're always um, orphaned. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, we always like love to double check about development and health. Um, you can give us a call, you can bring them in and we can definitely check them out. So opossums. Um, another reason I love opossums, like this photo shows, they're just kind of aliens to me. Um, they, a little fun fact about them, they have 13 nipples inside of their pouch, 12 in a circle, and then one right in the middle. So mom can actually have up to 21. She can give birth to up to 21 babies, but then the first 13 to latch onto a nipple um, get to survive. So I just think they are super cool species. Um, they eat a ton of ticks and other insects that you might not want around your garden. But um, yeah, so some general tips that we uh, talk about to the public with opossums is um, if, it, if an opossum's body, not including the tail, is bigger or as, as big as your hand, then um, they are good on their own. Um, that's when they are sexually mature, about 250 grams or like four months of age. So um, yeah, again, if there's a question, you can always bring them into us. If they're, you know, out and about on their own and they're eating the cat food that you left out for the feral cats, they're probably good on their own. If they're injured, definitely bring them in. Um, a lot of times we'll see, um, you know, them being hit by car, caught by cat, caught by dog. Um, we had an opossum come in earlier who was stuck in a fence for a while between two boards. So she was just real dehydrated, um, and a little shook up, but, um, yeah, it's almost impossible to reunite babies, baby opossums with their mothers. Um, if an opossum gets chased by a dog or a human and they just take off, the babies might fall out of their pouch or off of their backs. Um, and the mothers don't slow down to, to pick them back up. Um, so yeah, a lot of times, um, babies, um, will be in the pouch when a mom gets hit by a car as well. Um, I've made it a habit to always stop and check opossums, um, if they aren't, um, you know, very, if they're, if they're not, um, if they're deceased, you always want to check their pouches. Um, the babies might be in there and they might be starving to death. So um, I always, you know, we will get in whole deceased opossums and then we have to take the babies out of the pouch and raise them up like that. Um, so yeah, with opossums, they actually don't like suckle or anything like that. They attach to a nipple and it just kind of delivers milk to them. So we actually have to tube feed them. It is a pretty, you know, intensive process until they're, um, you know, about a hundred grams and then they'll start eating on their own. They'll start um, like lapping their formula as well. But yeah, we always appreciate when people are stopping and checking pouches. Um, the babies, if they're out of the pouch, they'll also hang around a dead mother. Um, We've had a lot of people, you know, see a mom on the road during the day. And then when they drive back that the same night, there's babies around her. They don't understand that, you know, she's passed. She's not going to be nursing anymore. And it can actually, um, they'll actually like ingest her blood somehow. So um, yeah, it's not great. It's not good for them. Um, and at that point, they're just too small to be on their own. So we get lots and lots of baby opossums in um, at the beginning of the year. So adult possums, like I said, um, most common injuries getting hit by a car. We see a lot of opossums with broken jaws or like their eyes popping out um, caught by cat or dog, emaciation. Um, unfortunately they don't live very long, only two to three years in the wild. So, um, they don't age very gracefully either. They, you know, will go blind, they'll start getting emaciated and then they pass. So, um, we'll get a lot of opossums in with bullet wounds. 
Um, and then also just wounds on their bodies from being stuck in fences. Um, so yeah, sometimes they just nap in weird places like on people's porches or in their sheds or garages. So usually a nudge with a broom will make them wake up and, and get out of Dodge, but um, they can also go into shock if they're chased by a dog or a cat into a corner, they'll just kind of play dead. Um, usually just giving them some time to come to will, you know, let, allow them to just leave on their own. Um, but they can also be encouraged to leave nicely as well. So we do get, you know, quite a few adults in as well that are, you know, just, just old. And then they all go to our sanctuary to just live out their life. Um, and sometimes they're just in shock. And by the time they come to us, they're nice and feisty. So we'll deworm them and send them on their way. We love when people are willing to take them back to where they found them or to the closest park nearby. So um, they are urban animals or, you know, most of the animals that we take in in San Antonio are urban animals. So they're used to being around people, traffic, dogs, cats, um, other animals. These guys loved uh, cat food. They love to come out and eat cat food that people leave out for feral cats. Um, people will find them in their, their garage cans, um, hiding in their sheds, like I said, just taking a little nap. Um, so baby squirrels. Yeah, we get a lot of baby squirrels as well. Um, a lot of the same information that we talked about with birds is the same with squirrels. You can put them back in their nest. Um, squirrels and doves make very, very shallow nests. So after a windstorm or even just a thunderstorm, um, we do get in a lot of babies the next day. If they're not injured and it looks like they had been fed pretty recently, we'll always ask people to take them back and, and put them back up in the nest. Um, you can even make that makeshift nest. You can leave them at the base of the tree. Mom can actually come down and, and pick them up and take them back up to the nest and they will. Um, if humans are like, if you're, you know, if you put the baby back in and, and you're just standing there, they're not going to come back. They are obviously skittish of, of humans, but um, yeah, we go by how fluffy their tail is to determine development as well as their weight, obviously. But um, yeah, if a juvenile squirrel comes in and somebody thinks that he's orphaned, um, we'll weigh him, make sure he's not injured, and then um, probably send him send him back on his way to go back up in his tree and in his territory. So uh, kind of grouped um, all the other mammals together, raccoons, skunk, foxes, coyotes, ringtail cats, a lot of the same information um, for, for these guys. So um, this happened just a while ago. A guy found a fox at the edge of his like land. And, you know, I asked him to just kind of leave him there, check on him in the morning. Mom is probably in the area. She'll come back out. He was just about the age where he was leaving their den. He was probably just doing a little bit of exploring on his own when this guy came around and just picked him up, um, thinking that he was a puppy or a, a kitten. But, um, yeah, so typically we ask people, you know, if the baby is, if you just found them and the baby is healthy um, and nice and hydrated and warm, um, we just ask that people leave them outside near the area where they found them. This can also apply to if you're trying to get a mother and their ba her babies out of an attic, um, just putting the babies outside. Mom will typically get the picture and, you know, take her babies to a new place. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had a lot of success with this. Um, a lot of times people will call us back the next day and say, oh, the raccoons are gone. Like I, I heard mom come in last night. Um, we do this with cottontails as well. So if a cottontail baby is displaced or, um, you know, you find a nest while you're, um, like weed whacking your your tall grass or anything like that um, just leaving them there they'll usually be back in the nest by the next morning nice and um, fat belly and full of formula so um, yeah we always 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 want to give mom some time to reclaim her baby um, like I keep saying over and over again they are much safer and happier and um, you know they're going to survive a lot better in the wild rather than in rehab. So I feel like half of my job is convincing people to just like not kidnap this animal. Um, 
but yeah, just observing for 24 hours. Um, and, and then, you know, if, if baby is still there crying out or, you know, getting dehydrated and lethargic, we definitely want to take them in, um, within 24 hours. So, um, our general rule of thumb for raccoons, um, is if they're the size of a football, if their body is the size of a football, then they'll leave their mother soon. They're just about juvenile, um, sub adult, and they will be off on their own soon. So a lot of people will call us and say, oh, there's, you know, these raccoons, they look really young. Young. they're here eating our cat food and it's like usually they're good to go um so yeah we definitely don't want to bring in any healthy juveniles so fawns we are getting tons and tons of fawns now um when I worked in Candelia, that was my favorite animal to take care of. I got to go out to the fawn yards and just bottle feed all the babies and they all come up and just want to eat all at the same time. And then we start weaning them off and then they don't want to have anything to do with you. Um, so it makes catching them up and releasing them a lot of fun. But um, yeah, so if you find a fawn that's calling out, walking around by herself, she looks really weak or she's covered in fire ants, you can definitely bring them into WRR. This, this probably means that mom is gone. She might have been hit by a car or shot. Um, and it's not common to, to see a, a fawn walking around by themselves. If a mom has truly just left them um, to go and eat because the, the fawn doesn't have a scent, so she's safer by herself than with the herd for the day, um, then she should just be laying down nice and curled up, just like in this picture. Um, they, they know just to wait there. They don't make a sound. They don't move. Um, so yeah, if you find a quiet alert fawn bedded down in the grass, just leave them alone. Even if it's right next to a roadside, um, even if it's, you know, in a really weird area, if your dog wants to go outside, please just keep them on a leash. He will be gone by the morning. Um, they typically don't bed down in the same area twice. Um, but yeah, it is mother deer will leave their babies for a very long time every day they'll come back um around sunset and feed them um but like I said yeah they don't they don't have a scent so they are safer without without the herd so um I was able to convince a woman just earlier to take the fawn back to where she found him um he was a little close to like a neighborhood road but um we made a little sign for him to you know, put the baby back, put the sign there, caution, don't disturb. Mom will come back and get her. She had a nice full belly. So I knew that mom had been there recently feeding her. And she said that there was a herd in the neighborhood. So yeah, very successful day of reuniting babies, hopefully. Um, so yeah, cottontails, they make super shallow nests in grass. Um, we get a lot of cottontails that have been, um, you know, cut by a weed whacker or a lawnmower. Um, they are like fawns in that they get left alone for most of the day so that mom can forage. Um, you know, mom doesn't want to draw attention to the nest, so she'll come back at dawn and dusk to feed. Um, but yeah, common injuries we see with adults and babies, degloving from weed whackers or lawnmowers, puncture wounds from cats or dogs, being displaced by a cat or dog. A lot of people will say, oh, my dog just brought this in. Um, and since their nests are so shallow and just in grass, it's almost impossible to find their nest if you live on like a good piece of land. So um, we do, you know, take in babies that are displaced um, and then truly orphaned mothers a lot of time, you know, the dog caught the mom and then they found the nest because the babies will like call out for mom when they get hungry. They'll actually leave the nest looking for mom. Um, so if you find babies wandering around, that's probably a sign that mom is gone and, and we can definitely take them in. Cottontails are extremely stressy. I always ask people to just be completely quiet in the car and when handling them, just be very, very gentle. They can just die from stress very easily. So we, you know, are battling that constantly. We raise our cottontails in what we call the quiet room. Um, it's just a completely silent room. There's no other animals in there. It's all cottontails and jackrabbits. Um, and yeah, we just, once they're here, we just want them to be completely safe and comfortable. They always get a friend if, if there's someone else that's their size. 
um, and same species, but yeah, so reptiles and amphibians um, just kind of grouped these guys all together. Um, we don't see a ton of like orphaned reptiles and amphibians just because like when turtles are born they stay with mom for a couple of days and then they just go off on their own if that if a couple of days um, some guys are born completely alone and they just know exactly what to do but we do get a lot of injured animals uh, reptiles and amphibians and a lot of the injuries that we see are you know being hit by a car like this box turtle um, we get a lot of snakes in, stuck to glue traps, a lot of lizards like that as well. Um, caught by dog or cat is a very common injury in all of our animals. Um, and then just in inappropriate trapping by humans. Um, people will bring us venomous snakes and want us to deal with them. It's like, well, you know, we really would appreciate it if you just took him back. You know, he's not doing anything to you. He's actually probably doing you a favor by eating all the rats and mice around your property. So um yeah we typically do not relocate animals for people we're you know we're, we're very much against trapping and relocating um we find that it's it's you know from the research done it's it's a usually a death sentence for animals to just be trapped and relocated but um, we will talk a bit more about that in a couple of slides um so yeah other frequently asked questions by people how to prepare for spring, how to prepare for baby season. Um, definitely check your porches, decks, sheds, garages for holes or weak areas and seal them off. Um, if you don't want animals coming in there to nest, um, always double check things like roofs um, and then just block holes that might have occurred over the winter. Um, you can also cap your chimneys. Um, wild birds and mammals will come down there. And, you know, if you don't want them in your house, it is a good idea to cap them um, while you're not using them, of course. Um, and then always keep keeping your garage and shed doors shut at night. Um, you can, you know, get an animal in there and they will leave on their own if you just give them a, an exit point. Um, you can also avoid um, orphaning birds and squirrels by trimming your trees at the end of winter before birds and squirrels start nesting. Um, we get a lot of animals in that they just didn't know that there was a nest and now they're on the ground. Mom is gone, nowhere to be seen. Um, we've actually gotten animals in that were like cut by chainsaws um, from, you know, tree trimming companies. So there are a lot of tree trimming companies that will actually check for nests as well. Um, a lot of guys that we talk to um, that are great. And um, I always recommend just making sure that a tree trimming company is checking for nests or you're checking yourself before cutting any limbs down. Um, you can also trim your grass regularly, not let it get too high just because, uh, you know, the cottontails will nest in grass, but it, not if it's already cut short. Um, and then just not using glue traps that, you know, will save hundreds of animals every year per person. Um, you know, they don't just catch roaches or ants or mice or whatever you're trying to get to animal. Other animals will get into your garages and sheds and, and get stuck on those and, and die a pretty gruesome death. So that's that advice. Um, make sure your windows are safe for birds. Lots and lots of birds die from flying into windows every year. Like I said, we are a collection point for window strike victims. Um, so we get to see, you know, all the different beautiful species that are, are victims of, of birds and uh, window strikes in San Antonio. Um, so some will, you know, just be stunned, recover and fly away, but um, a lot of times they'll be killed immediately or they'll die later from internal injuries. Um, that's typically the case. Um, so you definitely want to just make sure that your windows are not reflecting the sky. I think that's the, the big issue with, with window strikes. Um, so there's some things that you can do that I, I just looked these things up. So you definitely can too. I don't know about like all these different types of glasses, but definitely do some research if you're interested in this. You can also, instead of just getting like new windows, you can also put decals on your windows. Um, you can put up a wind chime so that that they know like, oh, there's a building there. Um, you can have external shutters. 
you can put on tape strips, you can put on bug screens. Um, and yeah, I think the, the best option for just the everyday person is decals. Um, there's some really nice decals that you can put up. Um, and then, yeah, changing your home interior, you can, you know, put blinds up inside as well and just make sure that they're closed at night so that there's no, um, you know, lights, light on. Um, and, and then having your, your bird feeders away from windows um, and, you know, just, looking up other things I'm definitely do some more research about that that I need to do as well but um yeah that's a that's a big thing that we see so doing that um if there's an animal nesting in your house like this angry mama raccoon um we always ask people to just let them leave on their own there's definitely a lot of ways to deter animals um that i actually didn't even put on this slide but we always talk tell people to um, soak rags and ammonia and put them up around the perimeter of the area where your the animal is in your home um, see where they came in through when they leave when they come back uh, make sure there's if there's babies in there that you're taking those precautions as well to not orphan those babies um, and then you shouldn't be closing off any exit points before you know that mom and babies are gone if there are babies um, and you want to really be sure because then you just have a whole other problem on your hands. So, um, yeah, I mean, mammals grow pretty quickly. If somebody is okay with the mom coming in and out once in a while, every once, <laughs> every day, we usually say, you know, the raccoons will be gone in a couple of weeks. Um, they're not, they're probably not doing too much destruction, but I can't really talk. I have never had an, a raccoon in my home. Um, so there are some different things that you can do. That's why, you know, one of the main reasons we have the hotline is just to be available to people answering their questions, trying to see if we can like come up with a solution. Um, so yeah, the problem with trap and release, um, it's not great. We definitely don't ever encourage people to do that um, unless you're literally trapping an animal that's gotten into your house or attic and then just putting them outside of your house. Um, if you transport an animal more than a mile away, first of all, it's against the law. For any native animal, you cannot trap and relocate this animal more than a mile. Um, but also, where's the food? Where's the water? Where's my territory? Where are my babies? Where's my home? You know, it's it can it can honestly be a gruesome death. Um, they're you know they're not going to be successful in this new area. There's already predators. There's already all the territories are taken. Um, yeah. So instead, we try and um, you know just let the babies grow up and leave on their own. Mom is not going to have a reason to nest once the babies are gone. Um, we can deter them as well. Raccoons hate to have the light on in the attic. They hate to like hear music or anything like that. I've, I've seen a lot of sources that say rock music. I always tell people play NPR, put a radio up there, put, you know, your old iPod up there and just blast some NPR. They do not want to hear you know, human voices. Um, they do not want to have the light on at night. They want to be nice and comfortable up there. So if they have that ammonia, the lights, the music, typically that'll work to just deter an animal out of the area. And then we'll go back to, you know, that the advice of make sure everyone is gone before you patch those holes um, and just make sure that you're paying attention for any like scratching or whining that could possibly mean that babies are still there, um, or that, you know, mom is still in there. Um, so we definitely want to make sure all the animals are out before we patch up any holes. So yeah, like I said, deterring animals safely, soaking rags um, in household ammonia and just placing them around where you're trying to deter the animals. Ammonia is just a compound in predator urine. So um, that just tells the, the, the animal that there's already someone living here. This is already someone's territory. Somebody is already marked here. I better find a new place. 
Um, I've seen sources online that say sprinkle cayenne pepper around the area. We don't typically recommend that. I mean, obviously it can deter them, but if, you know, there's other animals that have access to that area or like children, obviously you don't want them to have access to cayenne pepper. Um, like I said, putting on NPR or rock loudly on a radio, um, leaving the light on, and then just making sure that there's no food items for them. If, if there's food, you're always going to have animals. Um, everyone loves cat food, not just feral cats. Secure your garbage cans, um, you know, leave them in your garage. Make sure that you're not taking your, your uh, garbage can out until the morning of garbage pickup. Um, I always like to double check that there's no one in my garbage can as well. I went to a state park one time and found three raccoons and three different dumpsters. So I'm paranoid about that now. I'm always checking dumpsters and just making sure that there's no one trapped in there. Um, but yeah. So that's all of my information. Does anyone, I guess we're gonna go to the, the question and answers part now. Um, yeah, um, so everyone, uh, if you have a question for Emily, um, go ahead and type it into the chat feature and I will relay it to her. Um, so we'll give you some time to do that. Um, Emily, the, uh, this was an amazing presentation. Uh, I, it sounds like there's been a lot of research done lately um, about things like trap and release. And um, I, I didn't know all of that about how detrimental that can be for an animal. You know, I never thought about it. I just thought it's a wild animal. Like it'll live anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting information. And um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think you guys are doing really, really great when you talk about how many phone calls you answer, how many wow. conversations you have with people, mm -hmm. um, and about what they can do to make sure that the animal, the, 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 best, the best happens for the animal and that it's not actually needing to come into your facility. Um, I'll bet that. I mean, I just, those numbers you gave out were amazing. Um, so I think it's great that you guys have like a constant hotline for that because when people see injured or orphan animals, they, you know, a lot of times they just get kind of panicked and they want to hand it over. And definitely. Uh, so I'm really glad you guys provide, provide that um, for yeah. our community. Um, we have a, a question. So what should we do when cave swallows start building a nest over our front door? Yeah, we get this question um, quite a bit. Um, I am not an expert on this, but I we have done some research on that. And um, I believe that once there are eggs in the nest, you are not allowed to tear the nest down. So if the birds are building the nest and you want to deter them, you can um, destroy the nest and they'll, you know, find a new place. Obviously they don't want their nest destroyed, but um, yeah, it, once there's bird, once there's eggs in the nest, then we, it, they are a protected species, I believe. So it is, you know, against the law to destroy their nests. Um, we have cave swallows um, or I believe they're barn swallows um, that nest over one of our doors in Candelia every year. And it is just so fun to watch them grow up and like watch mom and dad just swooping in back and forth, bringing them insects to eat. Um, so honestly, if you're down for it, I recommend just letting them be watching their progress, watching the babies grow up. It's like, you know, just natural beauty in, in nature, just watching mom and dad get to raise their babies so if you want you can destroy the nest before there's eggs but um, I always recommend just enjoying it while you can because they grow up really quickly um, and soon enough they'll be fudging the nest and flying around on their own so yeah I, I think that's great advice um okay we've got another uh question let's see Oh boy, a bunch just popped up. Okay. 
Somebody uh, is recommending uh, for the cave swallow uh, question. Uh, they're saying you can buy needle mats to put over your doorway, doorway or wherever to deter nest building. And I, I think we've all seen those, especially in downtown areas, um, mm -hmm. to deter, you know, pigeons from from roosting in areas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next question. Uh, several years ago, we had a mockingbird throwing itself at our window several times. We believe it. Th we believe it thought it saw its reflection as a rival, but we were afraid it would injure itself. What can be done in that situation? Yeah. So every year in Candelia, we have well, we have free roaming um, peacocks up there, and every year they like battle themselves in all of the cars. If your yeah. car is shiny and usually right. black, then they are just going at it. Even the other day we were out at a park camping and uh, Kingbird was just in our, in the rear, in the side mirror, just going at himself constantly for hours. Um, I think that kind of goes back to the decals, um, putting up something where they can't see a reflection in the window. Um, yeah. I haven't had a ton of um, experience with that. Um, but you know, what, um, we had one guy whose car was just getting beat up from this peacock. So he just like drove around the sanctuary set for a second and got his car really dirty so that really it wasn't dirty. reflecting <laughs> anymore. And that actually worked. So, you know, <laughs> dirty up your windows, get a decal. Um, I definitely need to do some more research about that, but um, yeah, just maybe even going outside and scaring him off so that he doesn't stay in the area. I'm sure he would like come back and be like, oh, my rival is still there. Um, right. But yeah, just making sure that you don't have your bird feeders too close to the to the windows and your, your bird baths and all of that. Right, right. Um, all right. Uh, we have another participant says that they recently found uh, a couple of non-native tortoises in a natural area uh, and they're assuming that somebody released them there. Um, they're wondering if you're finding uh, that more people are giving up pets that they obtained during COVID um, when, you know, everybody was at home and we, you know, we, we did all hear that a lot of people adopted a lot of cats and dogs during COVID, which was great. Um, but, uh, if people took on, you know, maybe exotic pets, non-natives, um, are you seeing, are you seeing any sort of increase? Have you seen any sort of increase in that? And, um, goodness, what would you do in that situation? Yeah. I mean, we definitely get a lot of, um, animals in that were ex-pets or, you know, non-native animals. Um, most of those animals will just go straight up to Candelia. They, um, you know, where they'll live in the sanctuary, obviously they're not native. We're not going to release them in Texas, um, or fly them back to wherever they came from. Sure. But, um, yeah, usually these animals were born in captivity anyway, but they, you know, they'll live in their, our sanctuary. Um, I'm not sure if we've had an increase in, you know, ex-pets or just non-native species as pets in general, um, just because most of them do go straight up to Candelia. Um, but yeah, we've seen this as well. We've had, um, you know, we have a chameleon in the sanctuary and um, an iguana who, you know, I, I did, I took in both of those animals and they were both just found like one of them, the chameleon was found at Friedrich wilderness, um, park and, um, wow. just very sad. They just, you know, this is not their natural habitat. Not, right. they don't know where the food and water is. Right. Um, and it's not the right thing to do if you want to give up your pets. So right. we do take in, you know, pets. If somebody wants to bring us a non-native animal, no questions asked, we will take them. Um, okay. we just don't want them to end up dead out in the right. middle of Texas somewhere. So right. I, I do think that COVID had something to do with that. Um, you know, people aren't, don't have enough time anymore for their pets that they got. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, why we, why we always just recommend, you know, we, we do some education about, um, you know, the non-native pet trade and, and exotic species in general, um, and just, um, right. you know, 
not owning them and then they're not living you or you can't take yeah. care of them anymore and then they're just like right. in this habitat that they have no clue how to survive so and it does seem like there's such an explosion and in interest in wild animals as pets and I it's just yeah. like worst idea ever yeah and I think it has a lot to do with just like social media as well yeah like everybody wants a raccoon or an opossum just to right, like take videos right. and pictures of and I um, just I I I have to question their like where is this coming from you know what I mean like mm -hmm. why do you need to take a wild animal and, and bring it into your home that's just mm -hmm. that's selfish you know really um so i well i'm glad to hear you guys do education on that as well um our next question uh they say i heard that we're not supposed to continue putting out bird feeders or water because of bird flu uh but i also heard that songbirds have not been affected by this it is very hot and birds are looking for water um so uh what, what is your advice on on that yeah, so um, as far as songbirds not being affected by bird flu, I haven't heard anything about that. All I've really heard that, you know, WRR is talking about just risk factors and all of that, because we do take in birds, we have birds in our sanctuary, um, right. is just that it bird flu is typically affecting waterfowl more than anyone else. So, and then, and it's mostly like, home flocks, people with quail or, um, you know, chickens, geese, ducks, things like that um, is, is who it's affecting most at this point, I believe. I think there's been only, you know, the quail. Do what? I'm sorry. Like, uh, like domesticated species? Yes. Okay. Yes. More so than like wild songbird. Yes. Kind of so I think it's a good idea just to like go by the rule of just, you know, cleaning your, your bird baths every few days, cleaning right. out your feeders every single time you're refilling them. Um, because there's other things other than bird flu that birds can get from feeders and, and baths as well. So you definitely want to make sure all of that is clean for them when you're refilling stuff. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, we have a comment, someone saying um, that uh, as chimney swifts are in trouble finding habitat, likely due to urban sprawl, some recommend uh, not capping chimneys, but closing the flue, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose then, so they could build their nests in the, in the chimney, but they wouldn't be able to get into your house. And gotcha. Yeah, uh, simply, I mean, that's something to think about if you wanted to provide that as a habitat. Um, mm -hmm. We, when I was growing up, uh, we would have chimney swifts in our top of our chimney every year. And you could always hear when the mother came back with food because you would hear. Yeah, that's awesome. Funny, but, but we, you know, we kept the flu closed. And so it was you know it was kind of like a fun it was a fun thing to to grow up with you know yeah but, well we'll yeah. have to um update the information on our website because a lot of the information for my powerpoint was on our website where we have lots of resources so i'll definitely talk to our development team about updating that information because i did not know that you know they were in trouble finding habitat yeah um all right, and uh, also Judith from Texas Park says that all native birds to Texas are protected. So once eggs are in the nest, they cannot, the nest cannot be removed. So all birds native to Texas. That's amazing, I didn't know awesome. that. Awesome, yeah, I didn't um, know that either. Uh, she also says once the nest is removed, you can put up deterrents um, such as the, the needle mats we were talking about. Mm. Um, she recommends uh, Googling some other options. Awesome. I'm definitely going to note that to make sure that our hotline specialists know that and that we update our, our website as well. You still there, Amanda? Um, 
Sorry, I might have, uh, my internet might have gone out there for a second. Sorry, Emily, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, no uh, somebody was wondering um, if there are certain hot spots, uh, uh, wildlife crossings, certain highway crossings where animals are found to be injured or killed. Um, Gotcha. Yeah. Our, um, our hotline specialists, um, especially David and Candelia, I don't know if anyone has talked to him, but he loves to chat with people. He actually um, compiles all of the data for us every year so that we know like what counties, what zip codes we're getting the most calls in. Um, yeah. So I would definitely be curious to know that as well. I know that we do get a lot of animals in that were just um, you know, hit by cars or found on the roads and they're just like in shock. They don't know where to go, what to do. Um, right. But yeah, I'm not sure of any like hot spots. Um, I am new to San Antonio and I've, you know, seen a few animals here and there on the roads, but um, so far haven't been tracking any, any hot spots right. or, or know of any hot spots or have noticed anything like that. So it's a good question. Right. right. Okay. Um, Oh, somebody's asking us to repeat what we just said about the swallows. Um, and we were just saying somebody recommended uh, rather than capping your chimney um, to keep swallows out of your home to actually close your flue and allow the swallows to nest in your in the top of your chimney just to provide them habitat. Of course, that would just uh, that would be a personal a personal choice there. Um, let's see. Um, we have a lot of people saying thank you and um, recommending wildlife rescue as a great place to volunteer. Um, I just want to make sure uh, if there are any more questions. Uh, anyone, we want to make sure that we get all your questions answered. Um, this, yeah, this was great, Emily. Thank you so much. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And um, uh, I'm hoping that, that you guys might get some, some calls uh, about volunteering from this. Yeah, so. definitely. Let us know. And I will put my email address in the chat um, just in case anyone has any follow-up questions or wants to know about That's volunteering. Um, there's also tons of information on our website. You can look um, at our job postings, volunteering, internships, apprenticeships, resources, um, and um, all the, the advocacy that we're doing, um, all of our certifications and things like that. So definitely there's, check that out. There's so many different ways to volunteer with you guys. There's so many different jobs. Mm -hmm. different levels. Um, you guys have an amazing volunteer program and uh, you you facilitate all kinds of interest from people. And I think that's that's super cool. And I know that's a big job to manage that volunteer program, but yeah. you guys do do a great job with that. So yeah, even if you don't want to like come in and be hands on with animals, you can build things for us, you can fix things for us. Um, right. There's always a need for like wooden bird cages with, you know, fine meshing inside, things like that. Enrichment, you can bring us supplies. We're always taking in newspaper, laundry, um, just like food, cat food, dog food, um, produce, anything like that is, is great. We take, you know, monetary donations. We're completely nonprofit. Um, so we take anything that you will give us. <laughs> so thank y'all so much. Y'all are an amazing audience. Thank you for all the questions and for being here.
Yeah, thank you so much for doing this, Emily. We really, really appreciate it. Y'all are doing an awesome job and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.